My mother was born in this house, in a tiny village at the top of the mountains in southern Turkey. She was born as the first child and a hearing child of a family with five other kids, three of whom are deaf. Like two and a half years ago, in our linguistics seminar here at Tufts, while we were discussing a paper on the communication system invented by a deaf kid, I happened to say, by the way, there are deaf people in my mother's family in a tiny village in Turkey, and they have their own sign language that is completely different from the standard Turkish sign language. And I said, there are actually other people in the village, they are also signers, and the entire village actually can sign uh, at, different varying, uh, at different proficiency levels uh, to establish communication with these deaf individuals. It was so, the, the people in the seminar room were so surprised and they were so puzzled, they were trying to understand what I was saying, and a colleague asked, you mean it's a village sign language? Well, to be frank, until that moment, I never heard something called the village sign language. And from people's uh, facial expressions, I could tell that apparently there was something special going on in our village, and until that moment, I didn't know that it was special. Quite hesitantly, I assumed yes was the correct answer to that question. Upon my response, my advisor's jaw literally dropped. Imagine, it's the 21st century, you are sitting in a, in a seminar room and you are discovering a new language. You know, that doesn't happen very frequently. The other day, I called my parents and I told them about the excitement about our village sign language and I asked them whether they could go to the village anytime soon and videotape the conversations of the signers so that I could show them to the researchers here. After, three days after this telephone call, taking my parents with him, my awesome brother drove for five hours in those windy, narrow mountain roads to get to the village on a winter day. And they recorded the very first videos of the signers for us. Here's an excerpt. <laughs> <laughs> we showed these videos to Okan Kubush, who is a deaf of deaf native signer and also a researcher of Turkish sign language. After watching these videos, he confirmed that this language was completely distinct from the standard Turkish sign language. Today, without any hesitation anymore, I can confidently say, yes, this is a village sign language that emerged in southern central Turkey in an isolated remote area without the influence of any other sign language. It spreads over three tiny villages at the top of central Toros mountains. That's why we decided to name the language after these mountains and now we call it central Toros sign language. Just like CTSL, there are about 15 village sign languages that have been reported so far in the world in various different communities. These are small, closed communities involving recessive deafness, and they are isolated due to social, financial, or geographical conditions. As a consequence of being isolated, the deaf people in these communities do not have access to the formal education and the sign language of that country. As a result, they end up creating their own language. For example, my collaborators have been documenting the linguistic organization of a village sign language called El Said Bedouin Sign Language. Despite being only minutes away from a larger town, ABSL, ABSL community is religiously and ethnically isolated. In our case, what caused deaf individuals to become isolated was the geographical conditions in the region and also lack of uh, financial resources to, resources to have access to the formal education system in Turkey. So you may ask why we are so interested in documenting these languages, which questions we are trying to answer. 
There, uh, there is no other natural communication system like human language. We can express thoughts on an unlimited number of topics using unlimited number of sentences. But how did we create this system? How does a language come about? How does the properties of a human language get their start from scratch? Well, obviously, it couldn't have been a bunch of caimen sitting around and deciding to make up a language, since in order to do so, they would have had to have a language to start with. If we try to solve this puzzle through spoken languages, we may not be able to make, some, make enough progress. Because spoken languages developed for, from older languages over time very slowly. We have very early written records of spoken languages. However, thousands of years ago, spoken languages had the same complexity that they have today. Pigeons and creoles might be good, uh, good resources uh, to address our question. These are spoken languages that emerge when, different, uh, when the speakers of different languages end up living in the same place and when they, need a when, they need, uh, when they need a common language to communicate with, they create these systems. But these are not completely new systems. These are mixed languages that originate from existing models. Village sign languages, on the other hand, are brand new languages that emerge, with, uh, that emerge without uh, a language model. What we have here is a language at its infancy a natural language that, that was born at a specific point in time. They are so young that their histories and development can be traced in a way which cannot be done in spoken languages. Just like the users of any other language, CTSL signers uh, can, express, uh, can communicate their messages in various different contexts. They share their feelings, they express their ideas, they exchange gossip, and uh, they discuss politics, they make jokes, and they use CTSL with their precious kids. What they are doing is language. By doing so, they provide us with a natural lab setting, and they give us the chance to study how language develops out of nothing. After visiting the village as a member of the family for my entire life, and after witnessing the birth of a language, um, after witnessing the birth of a language without knowing what I have been witnessing since my childhood, my, official, my first official field uh, visit uh, to the village was in, to, uh, in August 2013 with a wonderful team of researchers from University of California, San Diego, and with a lot of outside contributions of my uh, wonderful collaborators. During this field, uh, field work trip, one of the first things we did was to uh, identify how these deaf individuals are related with each other. Most of, the, uh, most of the deaf CTSL signers live in our village, and all of the CTSL, deaf CTSL signers are the members of my family. Here is the family tree. This is not a complete family tree, I just wanted to show the uh, deaf individuals, and here I am in the family tree. The deafness in the family can be traced back to six, gener six generations. What is striking in this family tree is that my mother's generation produced 12 deaf individuals. It's a big enough group to get the language going. And it's important to note that uh, not only the deaf, but the hearing members of the family who are not depicted in this tree are also very fluent CTSL signers. So, what does this language look like? During this, uh, during this fieldwork trip, uh, we, used the, uh, we used the pictures of familiar objects to investigate the vocabulary of the language. We asked signers to describe these objects. So, this is what the CTSL words look like. We have tomato here, knife here, and glasses here. Okay? So they have words that involve single signs, and they have more complex words that involve more than a single sign. Here, for example, we have wash plus a circular shape, which refers to uh, this plastic basin. And here we have cook plus the same circular shape, which refers to a cooking pot. What they are doing here is to combine two signs to name objects. 
this is, a this is one of the very effective strategies to increase the capacity of their vocabulary. And we call, in linguistics, we call this compounding. So they are using compounds to refer to objects. They use compounds to refer to people as well. For example, woman far away refers to a woman living very far away, and that would be me. So there's actually nothing so special about compounding. This happens in English as well, like food, food market, like job market. But what is special here is that we found this mechanism at a very early stage of a very young language. And more interestingly, our collaborators are, pre, uh, uh, are uh, reporting the same strategy from ABSL as well. So chicken, small circular object, refers to egg. Turn, white object, refers to oven. So ABSL signers are also using compounds to create new words. Different brains in different, bra uh, in different places uh, created the same pattern to increase the capacity of their vocabulary. In another task, we ask signers to watch video clips like these ones, this one, and uh, we ask them to uh, describe the action in those videos. So here, the goal was to investigate, the, uh, investigate whether CTSL signers had consistent word order in their sentences. We were interested in word order because word order was, is one of the strategies that uh, languages make use of to express who is doing what to who. For example, uh, here is an English example. The car hit the book. We know that it's not the book hitting the car, it's the car hitting the book, because word order is a grammar rule in English sentences, which is S, V, O, poses some constraints on how we understand this sentence. So English is a reasonably fixed S, V, O language. In CTSL, on the other hand, we observed many different alternatives. SOV seems to be the predominant word order in CTSL. However, there is not a single mechanism that works for everyone. People are trying different alternatives. But interestingly, our collaborators present that SOV is the predominant word order in ABSL as well. So, while making up a language, people create words, and when they need new words, they use strategies like compounding, and they develop rules to combine these words into bigger units, like sentences. Two of the basic ingredients of a language. Before I finish my talk today, I would like to mention one last thing. When I talk about CTSL, I, I receive this question a lot. People ask how I got out of the village. It was not me, it was my mother. She was the first girl uh, to get out of the village to uh, get a college degree, and uh, she served the country as a nurse for 37 years until she got retired last year. After my mother, for many years to come, not many other children were able to attend school, and until a decade ago, only two of the deaf individuals were able to uh, receive education. People learn language when their parents are speaking it. But what happens when there is no one to learn from or no one to talk to? Language comes to us so naturally, it's take, it is so taken for granted that we usually fail to recognize how special it is and how special it is to find a case like CTSL. It's so amazing that these people created the language out of nothing. And now we have such a specific, specific vantage point about how language develops, but this vantage point will disappear soon. As CTSL signers start going to school, they will stop using CTSL. Besides being an emerging sign language, CTSL is a highly endangered language. That's why it's so important to study and document such human heritage before it becomes extinct. Thank you.